So um, I'm going to present some work together with uh, one more last passage from Hartmann and Sudi uh, and also Sudi from, from Oxford. Do I need that? Is it, is it hard to do? They want to do it. Oh, they want to do it. Hello. I think it's working. It's working now. Okay. They're probably recording all these funny scenes now. This is the main thing. And the talk will be reduced to that, these, these few scenes. Anyway, so <clears throat> I, I, I should, I should um, give some introductory remarks before I start going to the talk itself. When, when you go to the classical environment, say, of applied mathematics in solving PDEs, Thank you. <laughs> uh, there are essentially always two stages. There is a lot of theory that tries to find out what is the regularity of the solutions of PDEs. And once you know the regularity, you know roughly what the complexity of solving them numerically is. Because in low spatial dimensions, there is an almost equivalence between regularity of functions and approximability by splines, typically by methods that rely on localization. In other words, you refine meshes, and as you refine, you get finer and finer and finer. And that is the paradigm that underlies the classical regularity spaces like Sobolev spaces, Bessel spaces. They all, in one way or the other, draw on localization. In fact, isotropic localization. Now, when you go to problems that are living in high spatial dimensions, and high spatial dimensions, I don't mean four. I mean maybe 100 or several hundred, and in some cases even 1,000. The game changes completely. And so this work was an attempt to sort of follow this old paradigm, to first find out what the regularity of certain objects in high dimensions is, but no longer in terms of classical regularity notions, because they are meaningless then, but in terms of approximability directly. So that is, that is essentially what, what, what this is about. So here is uh, roughly the content. I will start with a few remarks on the well-known curse of dimensionality. Uh, I will look at the problem setting, which uh, we'll be discussing in more detail. I'll present the main results in this area that we got. And if time permits, I will give some elements of the proofs. Some ideas, no, no, in, in no way uh, in any technical, uh, on any technical level, but at least some, some ideas. Okay, and if even more time is there, which I don't think is the case, I will have some uh, concluding remark. Curse of dimensionality. Okay, there's some work in the community of so-called uh, information-based complexity, people who thought hard about what can you actually do in high dimensions, what is best possible. They formulated several notions of tractability. And a typical scenario is this. You, you, you look at a function of, uh, say, d variables, d large. Now, you assume some regularity. Here, I just put Sobolev regularity of some smoothness class s. It could be any. Could be other, could be best of regularity, could be even continuity, uniform continuity. And you ask what is the complexity of approximating such a function in up to accuracy epsilon in the respective norm, say. And you measure this complexity in terms of two parameters, namely the target accuracy epsilon and the dimension d, which you sort of look at as a variable. And you ask what happens if that d changes? It, how is the complexity? going to grow, or how is it affected by the spatial dimension? So that, that, is, that is this thing. They formulated it in this work as the number of functionals you have to evaluate in order to get an approximation of uh, accuracy epsilon. Say. So when you do that, uh, and, and then you apply classical schemes, you, you get a typical work accuracy rate as follows. To, to get an epsilon accuracy, the number of the complexity more or less grows like epsilon to the minus d over s. And you see what happens. When d gets really large, the s hardly helps you. 
I mean, if S is two, like in a fully elliptic problem in, 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 in two dimensions, and D is 300, that really, that two on the bottom doesn't really help you. So the scaling is exponentially D. And if you look more closely, you find that in most cases, the constant also depends exponentially in D. So this is a, a bad situation. That's, what, that's what's called intractability. So what is the, what is the message? You, you, you can go two ways. If you really like your, your low dimensional schemes, you just impose so much regularity on the problem solution that even that doesn't kill you. So D, infinity. But by the way, uh, these people prove that even when D is infinity and all the derivatives are bounded by one, there is an exponential dependence in the constant. So cranking up regularity in the classical sense is not the solution. You can go to even more restrictive regularity notions like Korolev spaces, which, uh, which impose strong restrictions in an anisotropic way on, on the impact of different variables and so on. But then the question is, <laughs> is this a relevant notion? I mean, do these objects actually come up? Uh, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it okay to require that much of smoothness, or are you then working in the empty set, or something like this? So here, this talk pursues a different way, namely to say, well, in high, real high dimensions, you cannot have a, sort of a black box way of recovering functions with a quantifiable accuracy, you have to exploit problem intrinsic sparsity. So the, 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 the objects you are interested in, they must have some, they must be representable in terms of maybe problem dependent dictionaries in a reasonable way. Otherwise you cannot just physically just not get a hold of them. So this is it. And uh, where do such high dimensional problems of interest come up? Well, these are classical examples, like electronic Schrodinger equations, they live in the spatial dimension where the PDE is posed depends on the number of particles, <laughs> which in, in realistic scenarios is, is, is pretty big. Fokker Planck equations, the same thing. So these are just examples. So what I'm taking out of those two examples is that these are partial differential operators involved whose leading part is a diffusion. So as a first step towards understanding, we undertook the attempt to say, let's understand what you can say about solutions of diffusion <laughs> equations in high dimensions. Because that comes up in, in many scenarios. So this is the starting point. I should say the real motivation was something else. At, in, a number of years ago, there was a real flood of activities using tensor methods to, to solve PDEs in high dimensions. In particular, diffusion equations. And they showed seemingly wonderful results. I think there was a way out. To, you could beat the curse of dimensionality. But whenever I asked a person, what can you actually say about the solution? How accurate is it? I mean, you, you essentially solve a fixed discrete problem approximately. And that you do quickly. But what you then get in the end, how accurate is it actually with respect to the, to the, to the exact continuous solution? And that work was a little bit motivated by this. By sort of, there was a certain theoretical gap, what you could say, well, what you have computed now, you did compute something very efficiently, but what is really meaning what you computed? So that is sort of the regularity part of this question I, I added at the beginning. Well, another scenario is parameter-dependent PDEs. This is a very prominent setting in uncertainty quantification nowadays. So this is heavily studied. Uh, I'm not talking about this today, so I'm only talking about this kind of, kind of problem, but it has a sim similar origin. Okay, so we concentrate in what follows on this regime of high dimensional diffusion equations. But before I do that, maybe a little bit of motivation for those who are not constantly working in high dimensions. Why, why are tensor-based methods in principle of any interest. Why, why do they suggest a remedy in at least certain scenarios, okay? So we start maybe with a smooth function of D variables, defined on the, on the unit cube, if you wish. And if you think of a uniform mesh, where each 
in each dimension direction you have n mesh points. So you have a mesh size 1 over n. For this smoothness, you typically get an overall approximation rate that scales like n to the minus s. Okay? Because in each direction you have n a mesh of size 1 over n, and then you have d dimensions, but you only get n to the minus s, that d. In the accuracy, the d is not shown. But you have n to the d degrees of freedom. So that's the complexity. In d dimensions, you have n to the d mesh points. So if you recompute that and say, what is the number of degrees of freedom needed to get that, ac that accuracy, you get that typical scaling, which I showed before. And if s is just a fixed number and d is very large, you get nothing. I mean, you would have to work like hell in order to get a tiny little bit of, of, of accuracy. If you work harder and use something like, sm uh, that, like sparse grids, you could, you could improve that. But then you get the dimension dependence here in, 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 in that part. So there's no really win for large, large D. Well, a, a classical remedy is separation of variables. So suppose for a moment that object here is not just a, a generic arbitrary function, but suppose we can write it as a superposition of separable functions. Separable functions. So each function now in the sum, there's a certain sum, and each function is a product of one-dimensional functions. Separation of variables. If this is the case, and you ask yourself, well, what is the complexity of approximating an object like that? Now you can individually approximate this one-dimensional function, this d one-dimensional functions, and then you have r of them. So the complexity now scale in order to get epsilon accuracy scales like the number of terms in that expansion, the spatial dimension d, because they are d, uh, you have d such factors, and then for each factor you gain with n degrees of freedom n to the minus s accuracy. So if you recompute that, you see now that the complexity scales com in a completely different way than here. So what is it essentially? The, st the spatial dimension d only enters algebraically. And in fact, now smoothness start starts to help you because it will push this to just linear dependence on d. Epsilon go comes in in the univariate way. It's like what you get for smoothness s in one dimension. So this is like univariate complexity. d only inflates in a linear way, and the rank only grows a little stronger than linear. So when you, when you shrink epsilon, you can actually afford that r of epsilon grows. As long as it grows gradually, you have a manageable complexity. Because your d stays tame, your epsilon, that is something you cannot avoid, which is in one dimension, is, 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 is always there. And this is your inflation when you have more terms in this expansion. Wonderful. So this is basically the motivation for tensor methods in, in high dimensional PDEs. But it works under the presumption that R stays moderate. If you have no clue how this R has to grow so that this is a good approximation to this, that doesn't help you. So the key question in such methods is if you ask, can uh, such a method beat the curse of dimensionality in any way? The key question is, what is the growth of this when epsilon, when epsilon goes to zero? This now you understand, but what is the growth of this? So that's the key question. I must say, in the literature, is a heavily avoided question. As we see nowadays, when it comes to large-scale computation, people very often avoid certain issues, which are uncomfortable. <laughs> One must admit. Anyway. So this is now, let's look at the problem setting now. As I said, I will be looking at high dimensional diffusion equations. So the classical example is the Laplace equation. And I write it in a somewhat artificial way. Well, Laplace equation is a uh, Poisson equation. Where's it? Sure. Ah, over there. Maybe that is important to see. So Poisson equation is really sum j equals 1 to d d squared d dxj. So that's it. 
But of course, that is a partial derivative that acts on one variable. So formally, it's really a sum of rank one tensors, where in all other variables, we have the identity. It doesn't do anything. And here in one variable, we have this. But the point is that Laplacian is an order D tensor as an operator. Now, that doesn't really, isn't really the key. The key is you can look immediately at a more general set of problems where you have this sum of order D tensors with lots of identities, and where in low dimensions you have an elliptic operator. That could be a fourth order operator, that could be a, a, a diffusion operator with, um, with a degenerate coefficients, as long as you have an energy space for which this diffusion operator is elliptic. So our motivation came from Fokker-Planck equations where you have strongly degenerate coefficients, but you have an ellipticity in the right space. So it really doesn't matter to, to look at the Laplacian. So now, before you understand, when, when trying to understand these equations, you first have to understand what the energy space is. So what is the space on which this operator acts as an isomorphism? Because only when it is an isomorphism, you can revert it in a stable way, where errors now become proportional to residuals, which is the mother of all a posteriori error estimates. Anyway, the energy space. It would be great if this was the energy space. Namely, a tensor product of simple L2 spaces and one elliptic energy space in low dimensions sitting in between. And of course it is. And it has been used by many researchers that the energy space is actually an intersection of that. And that is a pain in the neck. Because it means that the norm uh, coming with this space is no longer a cross norm. A cross norm is a norm when you apply it to a, a, a rank one function, you get the product the norms. That would be a cross norm. That would be greatly convenient. But it isn't because it is at an intersection. So you get sums of such norms. But you can show that under these circumstances your problem when you look at a weak formulation of, of this operator, you get a bilinear form, you can do an integration by parts, and you, so, you show it's elliptic from this energy space into its dual. That means the operator is an isomorphism, and this means that arrows are proportional, uniformly proportional to residuals, and this is what, in principle, you can evaluate. Arrows you can, because you don't know the other solution. This is only involves only known factors. It's the right hand side, it's your kernel approximation, and it's the opposite. Well, it's tricky to evaluate because it's a dual norm, but, but in principle, this is the information that you have. Well, the question is, is it, is, is it really, it looks like this, this low rank form of the operator, you are working on product domain, everything factors. Is it really tensor friendly? Well, you can look at the spectrum of such operators, you can see there are doubts. Namely, suppose these are the eigenvalues of the low dimension components sitting in. So 1D, second derivative, if you wish. Then you can easily show that the eigenvalues of the, of the high dimensional operator is just a sum of these. So they are indexed now by multi indices, and they are just sums of low dimensional So if you invert it, even in the diagonalized form, the inversion of this sum is an infinite rank object. It's no longer separable. If you invert a sum, one over a sum, you don't get a final separate term. You get an infinite dimension. So, Clearly, even if your right-hand side is a rank one function, your solution will have infinite rank. The question is, how much does this operator inflate the rank of the right-hand side? And that would be the uh, regularity theorem. We would say the right-hand side has so many ranks to, uh, to uh, what, what will the solution have? So that's the real issue. Well, before I, I, I go into this, there's some analysis coming in and requires a scale of spaces. Like in 1D Sobolev space, it's not one space, H1, there's a whole scale. And when T varies, when T gets large, your know, objects get smoother, and when T gets smaller, your know, know, objects get, get coarser. And what one can do is, using eigen expansions, one creates always such a scale, of, a scale of spaces for which these operators are isomorphisms. They go, they just shift they just, just shift the, the smoothness scale by a fixed number. I'm not going in, 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 into this here, but this allows me to have a scale of, of regularity. Okay. Now, now we have to think, how do we 
rigorously go at the regularity of solutions of high dimensional diffusion equations, characterizing them in terms of approximability by tensors. So this slide starts to, to, to encapsulate this. So again, uh, we call, I remind you, this is a low rank. This is a rank one tensor. It's a product of one dimensional function. Now, we will be looking, so in short, I, I use this notation. Okay? So then we will be looking at sums of those. This will be rank R functions. Now, it is known since the Silva and Lin that these are unstable representations. They are not unique. You can have for the same, one and the same function different, different representations in terms of a certain rank. And there are all sorts of pitfalls. For instance, it is well known that if you look at sequences of rank R functions, the limit may be rank R plus 1. So it's like the limit of diagonalizable matrices. It's not necessarily a diagonalizable matrix. So there's an in, in unstable notion. First, we therefore consider attained versions of this. Attained versions of this representation. So we impose, we first look at functions that have a representation like this, but which have a certain smoothness, which cannot be any function. Not polynomials, nothing, generic functions, but with a certain smoothness. This is why I need this scale. And my rank R functions relative to H super T are those rank R functions where, which have a certain regularity. Now we have to deal with the fact that these representations are not unique. So what we do is we make a competition over all possible, all possible representations like this, and this triple norm here of such a rank R function is like a norm. It's not really a norm, but it, 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 it quantifies the stability of the representation. It takes the most favorable representations, namely where all these objects are smooth and have controllable norms in, in, in low dimensions. So it's just, it, 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 it makes, it tames the class of rank R functions to be manageable and not to have these cancellations of, of, of big terms possible. And now, what is approximability in, in, in our terms? Approximability in terms of rank R functions is now, you look at the inf, you take a function b, and you look at its best approximation from such a class. But you insist in this approximation that the guys who approximate are well behaved with this norm that we can see from here. So you look at a k-function. You add a scaled version of this norm, and you want this overall competition to be good. So that you require that this is good, and you require that this is small. And delta is always a small number. Delta you go to zero. And that is a k-function in, in, in classical approximations here, this is what something like this is, is, is referred to as k function. It depends on the two spaces here. So it means you measure accuracy in t, but you regulate smoothness in somewhat higher norm, in a somewhat higher norm. So the, you require those guys to be a little smoother than the norm in which you, in, in, in which you um, approximate. Okay? And what does it mean? Okay, it means if, for instance, you look at functions for which delta to the minus one, delta being small, times this k functional is controlled uniformly. What are, this is like a Lipschitz class. If, if this was a classical k functional, you would define Lipschitz functions like this. Okay, so all functions v for which this stays uniformly bounded is like a Lipschitz class. What it means here in, in, in terms of this is it means that you can approximate V by a rank R tensor with accuracy delta, and you can also assure that this stability norm of the rank R tensor is un uniformly under control. So this says you look at functions which are uniformly approximate. So what we want to do now is to tie this delta to the rank which is needed here. And that gives this kind of tensor sparsity measure. So we look at a sequence that goes to, z to infinity, gamma to the n. We will be always looking at, say, something like gamma to the n of n is n to the alpha algebraic, or is e to the c n to the beta, something like this. Something that goes to infinity strictly and, and can be, therefore, has an inverse function. Therefore, 
therefore gamma to the minus 1 of x exists. Okay? Okay, so, so all the functions that have the property that if you multiply the k functional not by delta to the minus 1, but by this rank dependent term, this stays always bounded. All the functions for which this always stays bounded, they form an approximation class. So this is now a rigorously defined class of functions with the property errors are measured in, in the t-norm, regularity of the approximating tensors in a slightly higher norm, and we are looking at all of the guys for which this norm, this thing here, stays uniformly bounded. Now we have described approximability in rigorous terms. It is a, a still a, a, a strange notion of approximability because the approximating functions are not finitely parameterized. The tensor factors are still generic functions. They are only limited in terms of, 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 regular, uh, of regularity. That's all. So it's not a classical approximation class yet. So, but before I, I want to use it, I, I know that this is kind of a Maybe at, on the spot, some of hard to digest. Let me, let me rephrase how to read this. These notions I just, I just put on, on the screen. Well, if a, if a guy is in this approximation class, then we immediately have a direct estimate, which says for each R, there exists a tensor such that it approximates V, this guy, at this rate. This is just by the definition. Defined like that. So this class comprises all elements that can be approximated by the rate gamma of r to the minus 1. So if this gamma of r grows exponentially, this is a very fast rate. Okay? But it also says that the approximating guy is under control. It has this bounded triple norm, and it is this triple norm is bounded by the k function, because behind this is, 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 is the k function. So that's what it says in a direct sense. It says like, V belongs here, I can approximate with this, uh, with this rate, and I can do it stably. The approximating tensors are under control. That's, that's all you, you have to keep, uh, keep in mind. There's a, dual, sorry, there's a dual point of view, which I will be using most of the time. The dual point of view is to say, well, I, I, I prescribe a target accuracy, epsilon. What is the work, or what is the rank that is needed to catch the target accuracy? So I, 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 I turn things around. Well, if you, if you say this is now the upper bound, and in order to reach epsilon, you have to make sure that this is less than or equal to epsilon, to be sharp, formally that this is equal to epsilon, and then you solve for r. Solving for r, you get a rank, the optimal rank needed to achieve epsilon accuracy behaves like this. So this is essentially the optimal rate. The inverse function of gamma of this, now, now that's the stability norm, that is the sparsity norm of the uh, uh, approximated function divided over the accuracy epsilon. And that's the inverse norm, the inverse function. I'll give examples to this. For instance, of course, in this case, the inverse function is something like a logarithm. And in this case, the inverse function is again an algebraic rate, but 1 over alpha. So as alpha is large, the inverse rate is always is, is, is then small. So this is the point of view I will be using all the time. And now I can formulate the results in these terms. So first, just regularity. So now we look at our equation with this high-dimensional diffusion operator, A u equals f. And we know something, we assume something about f, and we would like to conclude something about u. So that's the question. All right? So here is our assumption on f. It means it can be approximated by tensors with a certain rate, characterized by the growth function, by this gamma. Think of one of those. Could be any other one, as long as it strictly increases. That's your assumption. Now, we will find out a rate of, we will find out the growth function of the solution, of this guy. And I will give you a recipe how it depends on the data rate. 
for f. And to that I introduce this auxiliary function g of x. You see, g of x is x times a logarithm of the growth function. So this is increasing for sure. The growth function goes to infinity. The logarithm still goes to infinity at a much slower rate. So overall, this is a growth that is stronger than linear. It's just a little stronger than linear, possibly. OK? A little stronger than linear. If, if gamma is, uh, is just an algebraic rate, this is just by a log stronger than linear. So the inverse of this function again exists, but it's slower than linear. So this is slower than linear, and I, co I combine a new rate, which is this gamma hat. And you see, the gamma hat is the old gamma, but for, a, for a kind of a, a slowing down function. So gamma hat of r is slower than gamma of r, because you take gamma of a slowed down function. So here are examples. When gamma of r is r to the alpha, then the gamma gamma hat is r over a log, sorry, over a log to the power alpha. So it's essentially still r to the alpha, but it is attenuated by this log. So it's a little slower. If r is large, if r is large, then this is still comparable to this. When gamma is exponential, then you lose more. The gamma hat is still exponential, but it's only sub-exponential, because now you get another there's a little elementary calculation, so very difficult. But you get, you lose something. In other words, when you have extremely fast ra rates of your data, then your solution suffers a little bit more. The faster the rate of the data, the more the solution suffers. So, for instance, if your if your right hand side is a rank one function or a rank two function, fixed rank, you belong to any of those classes. But of course, the solution will not have finite rank. But you can see that the, so the solution is governed by still a very rapidly increasing growth function. So its rates will, uh, will be very good. That explains why in all these examples people compute with a low rank right inside, actually things get look very good if you use only a moderate number of, 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 of curves. All right. Uh, now the statement. So this is a situation, f has a certain tensor approximability characterized by gamma. Then we define this new gamma hat, and the result is that u, the solution, is approximable in terms of this gamma hat. And that means, again, there exists for every r a, a, a rank r function with a little more smoothness here, smoothness increased, by this one so that you can stably approximate by this rank r function at this new rate, which is a little slower than the original one. And the examples are shown here. For instance, if the... Have you now assumed that you are elliptic border? What? Have you now assumed that you are elliptic border? Or no, no, no. I have assumed of elliptic of that order of the operator. That is... I'm curious about this. About the t? Theta, the theta yes. Yes. Oh. Why? Yes, and no, no, I'm sure. Plus two. Why You're right. It's two a plus. Smoothly. Yeah. In, in, in the elliptic case, the multiplying factor is just one. It's, it's, it, 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 the t scales with the order of the operator. So there is a, if, if there's a fourth order operator, there's a hidden t in the, in the scale t. But think of, think of order one. Think of order one, okay? So what this means is the data are also a little smoother than just. Um, when t is minus 1, the data would be a little smoother than, 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 than the, just the necessary regularity for ellipticity. And one can show that the map that goes to, uh, say, the best approximation is actually continuous. Now, this is not the end of the story yet, because these approximants here are generic functions. They are low rank functions, but the factors the G factors, the low-dimensional factors, are not polynomials or splines or anything. There could be any solar functions in low dimension. So this is not a finite parameterization yet. So the question is, what is the cost in terms of finite parameterizations? How much computation do you have to do in order to realize this? And then there's a second step. You have to say something about these generic low rank functions, which are coming from an infinite set from a continuum of sets. 
So that's the next, that's the complexity theorem. And I specialize right from the beginning to t equals minus one. So the data have minimal regularity. The sum excess described by the fact that you can approximate them well by somewhat smoother tensors. So the, ten the tensors they are supposed to approximate the data are a little smoother than h minus one. So this is an indirect way of quantifying excess regularity in the data. A very mild one. Psi will always be less than or equal to two. So it, in, in particular, in all this theory, there is no high regularity of, of function in, in, in high dimensions. It could be actually very low regularity, even in low dimensions. And you still beat the curse of dimensionality. Because this is now the result. It, 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 it says, for every target epsilon accuracy, target accuracy epsilon, I can find a rank bar r which grows like this, gamma to the minus one. So this is the optimal rate in this case for the data. So if this was everything, you would have just the same rank as the data. But it is inflated. It's inflated by a log epsilon to square. And there's a uniform constant. It depends on the excess regular. Fixing that, this is fixed. So it's the, it's the best possible rate for the data inflated by the log epsilon. And I hope I will get to the point to explain why this log epsilon comes in. So that would be my minimum goal of, for the proofs. Anyway, the statement is then, I can match, I can, I can approximate the solution by such a guy with epsilon times the stability normals of data. I could rescale it and then this f should move here. And that, that was once to this, but it clutters this mutation. So I decided this way. And to you, again, the, the, this function is stable. That approximating low rank tensor can be controlled by the stability <laughs> norm of the data. Now, the point is, this function now is finitely parameterized. It can be written, can be described in terms of finitely many parameters. And I give you an estimate for the bound of parameters that they are needed. And that estimate is, well, first of all, of course, it's the rank. I mean, that comes in. That was in our, in that little pre-calculation I did at the beginning, that always inflates. The more functions, the more rank, the higher the rank, it multiplies, it comes in. So that's still the same as here. But as, there must be more. And this is what is more. You see, this is exactly what we, so of, of the type which we had at the very beginning pre-calculation, <laughs> what the tensor approximation could give you. It's essentially a somewhat new superlinear, which is helped by the fact if you have a large excess regularity. This makes this one smaller. But I, we cannot generally quantify this constant. It's a fixed constant. That's all we can show. Typically larger than one, but it's a fixed constant, independent of d and anything. And this is also what we, saw, what we saw in the low dimension. So it's a low dimensional dependence on the accuracy. The dependence comes mainly in here by the growth function. So if this gamma is exponential, this is another law. So this is very small. So this clearly beats the curse of dimensionality in, 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 in full flash. And this is, a, again, a, a mild inflation with a logarithmic dependence on the dimension d as well as on the accuracy. OK. So we, you get what's called polynomial tractability in this framework by uh, Novak and, and, and Wojnarkowski. So elements of the proofs. Do I have five minutes, Peter, or 10? Yeah, you have five minutes. OK. If you want, oh. go to the first part. Oh, OK. So let me, let, me, let me give you a few, a few indications. I, I've mentioned the Eigen system. So suppose you know the Eigen system of the, this is just for analysis, the Eigen system of the low dimensional operator. So here are my diffusion operators with that. Think of the Laplacian, second order derivative. So you can exhibit these Eigen functions directly. So then we know that the Eigen system under the given circumstances, with all these tensorized domains, everything, the eigenfunctions of the high-dimensional operator are just tensor products of those with the corresponding eigen, 
eigenvalues. We know that. So this can be used in classical Fourier method terms to define a smoothness norm. This is now the precise definition of that smoothness scale I gave you before. So it's most conveniently done in terms of these eigen expansions. So the eigenvalues are just scale. This is the smoothness. And in this scale, which is not always the same as this would coincide with the Sobolev function for a certain range of regularity, typically around H1, but not for all T. For all T, nevertheless, the operator in that scale is an isomorphism. So again, as said before, the, the inverse uh, uh, has a red matrix representation that would be uh, diagonal, but the diagonal entries are not separable. It's our inverses of those of, of, of these sums, infinite range. But the main reason for looking at those at, at those eigen expansions is on one hand to have this convenient scale of smoothness, on the other hand, to have a representation for the operator exponential. Now you say, why the hell do people look at the operator exponential in this case? Because that's the crucial role in, in, in this situation. The operator exponential applied to a function of many variables. It can be, of course, defined like this. Now, we can do that. And here's the reason why this is of interest. There are classical results by Hattrich and Bress, taking back a decade, a decade or more, on exponential sum approximation. This is what's called an exponential sum. There are weights, real weights, and exponents, and the variable is sitting here in these exponents with different weights in front of them. Finite sum. What did these people prove? They proved the uniform approximability of x to the minus 1 by such exponential function. In fact, the results were much more general. You put x to the minus alpha to certain alpha. So square root of 1 over square root of x was also counted. So, so these are beautiful results. Well, you could say, oh my god, but why do you do this? Why, why do you replace something simple like 1 over x by something complicated with these guys? I tell you right away why this is useful. Well, they also have implications for this, but, but I would like to do to use it for approximating the inverse of A. So X gets replaced by the operator A. This is why I need the operator exponential. Why? And here is the, 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 the main result that we proved there. And it, 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 it is a little different from that. Because what does it do? It gives a rate on the operator norm of a to the minus one minus this finite exp exponential sum of the operator. It quantifies the operator norm, and you can see what happens. It is a mapping property. S is larger than or equal to t. So this is a mapping mm -hmm. property that takes into account that a coarse function gets replaced by a smooth function. So it's a mapping from coarse to smooth function. And you can see, if you stretch this smoothing effect for, to, to have a large difference between T and S, you pay here. OK? So this may eventually evaporate. When S minus T equals 2, then it cancels out and you get nothing. You get just boundaries. So you have a precise representation of the loss in terms of a mapping from a, a less smooth phase into a nice thing. This is a key analytic result. In, in all of this. And now let me tell you why this, why this kicks in. And uh, so, look at a rank one function first. So, so suppose your right hand side is just a rank one function with one dimensional factor. Now you apply the inverse of a to that rank one function. In other words, you solve the equation a u equals this rank one function. Well, we replace this by an exponential sum because we know that this is approximable in this way. Now we choose the r so that the accuracy is actually epsilon. How do we do that? We just put the r here, which makes this less than or equal to epsilon. But see what happens. If you apply the exponential sum, now we know what this is. I defined this before. It's the sum of exponential of the operator applied to tau. The tau goes below. So the exponential of the A is an operator that applies to tau. Now you can see because of the structure of A, all these sum ends commute and they factorize. 
And exactly what you get is a, this becomes a product of, this becomes a rank one function. Meaning this product of the low dimensional guys acting on the low dimensional factors of P. So this immediately separates the approximation. And how many terms you need is this R. And as if, if you compute the R that makes this left an epsilon, you see R is log epsilon squared. And that was the inflation factor on the, on the, on, on, on the previous side. And you go back. Back. This was the inflation factor on the previous side. So this is what you cannot avoid. This is what you cannot avoid, and this is, uh, this is what we get. So I could give you, a, uh, I could also, let me, let me say this, two words. The complexity result really is, uh, is realized on realizing the virtual scheme. And that virtual scheme eventually involves approximating the exponential sum. And what we do, and it has all sorts of analytic ingredients, but what we do is we approximate the exponential sums by, by a dumb for two years. The point is this has been done before by Kakush and, and Kowalski, but in a discrete setting. So what they did, they, 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 they discretized the operator at the very beginning and then approximated the discrete term. So they lose the contact of the discretization of the operator and the accuracy defined. So we don't do that. We do it on the infinite dimensional level. And how do we do that? Well, it is well known that this can be represented as exponential by a counter integral in the complex. <coughs> and, 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 and this can be treated by a trapezoidal move which converges exponentially. That's the point. So you need only log accuracy quadrature points to get an accurate quadrature approximation to that exponential sum. And that can be done in total, uh, 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 in, in, in parallel. You can, and it boils down to solving only one dimensional solver, resolving problems, namely the one dimension, low dimension PPs that should be an A. That should be an A. So that, that's the game. Anyway, I, I wanted to give. Oh, I skip over this. Sorry. It's another talk. It's another talk. Uh, here are some entries. I, I want to conclude with this. This is a call for nominations for the so called uh, Smale Prize for the next FOCM conference. So if somebody uh, needs more information, I just flash it on. Actually, the deadline is going to be a little bit too close to October 15. So if you have a very good candidate that is worth the smell in the name, you can go ahead and, 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 and submit something. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. So I certainly like the introduction of a new, huge scale of basis for analysis of complicated problems. I think this is the main result of your hint. But the question was, from a practical point of view, uh, as you said, this explains the success of many of these sample examples. And I think because the right hand side is the sample of low rank. Like low rank. So most of the right hand side in my it's dimension are very, yeah. very so now the question is certainly, uh, you have to pose there will be applications which could be. Yeah. You can, you, I give you a description of the right hand side. Can you in some way check reasonably that it belongs to one of these assumption spaces for which you can well, if be you sure? Have, if, if your right hand side is finite range, it does. Yeah, yeah. sure. It's okay. Otherwise, no, I, I don't know. It depends on F. It, it, it depends on each case. But that's the same with greater approximation. Does the, does the right hand side and just asking this is this a usual question? Can yeah. you somehow yeah. find out yeah. by discretizing the right hand side or by doing some approximation scheme? It depends on the function. And the, I don't think there's any universal any universal answer. The point is only in, in applications the right hand side is given by the model. So he has a fixed representation of it. And then you have to deal with that given that's the same in any regularity without any If your right hand side has this smoothness, your, your solution will have. 
And people cannot always say what the regularity of the right-hand side is, but they can only say, if it has this smoothness, your result will have this. But in terms, by the way, Marcus has implemented that speed. And it serves as a background comparison, one more second, Tasha. It serves as a background comparison verification scheme for other methods. Because the obvious drawback of the scheme I was outlining in the end, without going into any details with the done for integral, is that it's really restricted to this particular structure of the operator. Namely, that it is a, it's a, it's a sum of, of, of D rank one functions. If you go away from this, that analysis doesn't work. So what we did in a different world, and that was that last slide we just did, a universal scheme that applies to any high dimensional operator. We proved for this universal scheme that if the solution belongs to a certain regularity class, the scheme will reduce it up to a, 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 a little bit of a, a pollution. But it essentially reduces this. This theorem says only these are relatively approximation classes. In fact, for these kind of problems, sub-exponential rates are relative approximation classes. And then for sub-exponential rates, a universal scheme, which is completely different, it does not require this particular, this particular structure of the operator. That universal scheme recovers then these approximability rates. And it's interesting to know, if you, say, replace this Laplacian in high dimensions by a diffusion operator with a tridiagonal matrix, say, just a tridiagonal diffusion matrix, which couples neighboring variables, the tensor approximability goes down tremendously. It goes down tremendously. And we can actually numerically prove it because we have a scheme that we proved does the optimal way and it shows a tremendously slower rate for such functions in comparison to the, to the ideal uh, low end representation. So, that's my answer to this. So, if that was set my question. Now, if you go away from this, oh. even if you have a If you have a convection curve, yeah, it changes. Yeah, absolutely. If that is a strong convection, it screws up everything. Absolutely. Then, then this, this is not the right formula. Mm -hmm. right? This is not the right formula. But people usually tend, oh, oh, oh tensor methods are hip now. We, we have all this wonderful hammer, and uh, we, we apply it to everything that doesn't move up to the tree within three seconds. No, I, I think in this exponential sum approximation, the symmetry doesn't play a role. No, no I don't think so. It's, it's, it's a fact that these, that these summons commute. And they commute because they don't couple different uh, variables. So if you have a tridiagonal term, you can't do that anymore. You have commutators sneaking in, and they screw up your business. And I really tried hard to, to still estimate this. And uh, I, the results I got are always very pessimistic. And then finally, with Marcos in this other work, we had this universal algorithm and it showed. I mean, this is what you get. You, you, you don't get more. That's life. Okay. Any other questions? Any answers? Any answers, <laughs> yeah. Answers, please line up with me. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.